Well, as during one of those verses of Amazing Grace, I stopped singing and I just listened. And you all sounded awesome, just all of us singing together. Um, sometimes in church, just, just stop singing and listen to others singing around you. And it's, it's quite beautiful. Um, it's, it's what the Bible talks about when it says, um, sing to one another, psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. Um, Matthew 28 in your Bible, turn there. We'll be in the final three verses today. I'm going to show you some logos this morning, and I want you to tell me what this organization makes. What do they make? Chicken straight from the gates of heaven, straight from the kitchen of heaven right there. Um, they, they talk about the five love, love languages, you know, a physical touch and words of affirmation and all that. Chick-fil-A is my wife's love language. We eat there a couple times a week, um, at, at least. Um, next... Yeah, vehicles, cars, trucks. Um, I, I used to be a Chevy guy. I think I'm coming around to Toyota. It's what my wife drives. I think my next vehicle will be a Toyota. Um, motor oil. That's what they make because their coffee is so strong that you could put it in your engine while you're. You could put it in your Toyota engine while you're eating your Chick Fil A sandwich. Um, yeah, computers and iPhones. You, you, some of you have a phone made by them in your pocket right now. Um, yeah, sh yeah, sportswear, tennis shoes, various things like that. The most uncomfortable items in the history of the world to step on. That's what they make. Yeah, it's, 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 it's the thing that, that often we um, can name what an organization makes right away. But when it comes to um, a different kind of organization, sometimes we can't immediately name what, what they make. Um, it, it, it's the fact that Jesus left the church to do one thing. He gave us one task. He gave us one set of marching orders. We are to do a lot of things as a church, but we're commanded to make one thing and do it really well. And that's in Matthew 28. We find those marching orders. Look at them. Verse 18 this is after Jesus has risen from the dead. Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. Jesus gives this commission because he has all authority. He has risen from the dead and defeated every enemy that has ever faced him through his resurrection. I'm very excited for 2021 at our church. I spent a good amount of last year thinking and praying about this year of what we could do as a church. Um, since we were able to do very little in 2020, we have endless opportunities this year, uh, eventually, as time goes on. Um, and church, I want us to champion what Jesus called us to do this year, make disciples. I want that to be what we do. We can do a lot of things at church, but if we're failing to make disciples, we will not do as Christ wants us to do. At the beginning of a year, a, a lot of churches will, will do what they, what they call a vision for that year. They'll, they'll set out a vision. Um, a lot of times it's got some kind of hip, cool name like Emerge or Transcend or Above and Beyond. And I can't say I'll never do that, but, but I know that I'm not hip. You, you look in the dictionary at the word dork and there's a picture of me. So, so I, I know that's not me. Um, my vision for 2021 is simple. It's the vision Jesus gave the church. Make disciples. Make disciples. This is not some hip idea I came up with. This is what Jesus has always called the church to do. I want that to be what we make our lifeblood about this year. Everything that we breathe and do, we're making disciples. Making disciples, we must be about two tasks. You see them in the passage. Go make disciples. You do this by baptizing them. And teaching them, baptizing them, we, baptism doesn't save you, but obviously baptism is the sign that you, to the world that you have been transformed inside by the gospel, and then teaching them to observe all that I've commanded you, everything, teach them the Bible, teach them everything Jesus taught, two tasks, baptize them and teach them, uh, reach the lost, and 
grow the found. Those who, have, who were lost, now they've been found, grow them in their faith. We want our church to grow. We want, our, we, we want to see the Lord adding to our number regularly as He did in the book of Acts. We want to see people getting saved. We want to see people getting baptized. We, we haven't, because of COVID, it breaks my heart, we haven't baptized anybody here since the fall of 2019. Like, like that breaks my heart. We, we want people to join our church. We want to see people joining our church regularly. Join the church. Not, not, joining, but, not, not joining the church, but acting like you're a member of the church is like a man acting like he's your daughter's husband and not marrying her. Like, like understand that. If you're not a member, join the church. Jo- join the church if you're here acting like a member. We want to see members growing in their faith. We want to see the Lord adding to our number through salvation, through baptism, and through growth. Now, some of you may hear that and you may get a little worried. Oh, no. Aaron's young and he tries to be hip with some of his jokes. Is he wanting to make us a mega church? And no, I don't. I don't have the leadership capability to pastor a mega church. I struggle with, with 150 people. Um, but, but can you imagine if our church was monthly seeing people get saved? Can you imagine the joy of seeing people from our church being called by God to the mission field and, and into ministry? Like, imagine if your grandchildren got to come here and, and see the kingdom of God visible every single Sunday when they're your age. Can you imagine if we outgrew our sanctuary so that we sent a group out to plant a church somewhere else in Tiff County? Because that's how they did in the New Testament. They didn't build a bigger building. They started another church. They sent some of those people out to do that. Perhaps you hear this and you say, I think our church is doing just fine. People are here. People are smiling and friendly. There's no problems. Nobody's causing division. There's no debt. And I agree. We have a terrific church. I'm so privileged to pastor here. This is a wonderful church. But but those things you just described are what our church looks like now. Let's jump into the future and think for, for a minute. Let me share some numbers with you that that the Lord's constantly been putting on my heart that have just really concerned me over the past several months as I've been thinking. Um, Since I've been pastor here, two years on the 20th, this previous Wednesday, um, was my two-year anniversary here. Um, Since I've been here, if I've counted right, we've had 10 of our members die, and and we've, we've added two from outside the church. So, so, so two people have come from outside of our church, joined our church. We've lost ten. One of those two we hired. It's Caleb. So in two years, we've lost ten. We've gained two. Let's just break that down. Five people we've lost a year. We've gained one. That, that's the numbers. And so we're a good church. We're a really healthy church. So you may not notice that from day to day. But let's jump into the future and see how that plays itself out. Because one thing you can be certain of, people are going to keep dying over the years. It's, it's going to happen. So, of course, that's not going to be the rate every year. Five people are not going to die every year. Some years it's going to be more, some less. We pray for less. We pray for years where nobody dies. But let's just, let's just run that out. So we averaged 146 in 2019 on Sunday morning. If we work at that rate, if we lose five, gain one per year, um, let's just say that's how it played out. Um, this is what the numbers look like. We can't do 2020 because, you know, that number was completely bonkers. Um, in 2030, that's 102 on average on a Sunday morning, if, if it remains at that rate. 2040, 62. 2050, 22. So 30 years from now, we're, we're down to 22 on a, on a Sunday at that rate. Those numbers are not counting several other factors. They're not counting young people who move off to college and never come back home and join a church where they're at. It's not counting people who leave our church for whatever reason. They, you know, move out of the area or they get mad at me or they they find another church that they like better or or whatever. Um, It's not counting the fact that Lifeway is saying that on average churches will see 20% of their people never come back after covid Probably less for our church because of the family dynamic, but, but that's what they're saying. Um, they actually say the, the, the new definition of a big church after COVID will be 250 people. That used to be the definition of a small church. The maximum of a small church was 250 people. Understand, I don't find my worth in how many people are at church on Sunday. If I did, I'd never be satisfied and I'd be insane. Um, anytime I'm at a pastor's gathering, the most common question I hear is, how many of y'all running right now? 
Because a lot of pastors find their worth in how many people are in their church on a Sunday morning. I'm not concerned about the numbers. I'm concerned about souls of people because numbers represent people. I'm concerned about the the spiritual health of our people. I'm concerned about obedience to what Jesus has called us to do. Gather for worship and make disciples. Uh, I'm concerned about the legacy of our church. We've been here longer than Chula has been a city. Like Chula was not Chula when Mount Zion was started. That's why First Baptist Chula is First Baptist of Chula because we were here first before it was Chula. And just understand, times are changing. So you can't just count on your great-grandkids to keep the church going because that's what's always been done in the past. As the years pass, less and less are the descendants of people going to keep a church alive just because that's what the people before them did. So what's the solution to all this? What, what's, the, what's the solution? Because there is, a, there is hope, there is a solution. I wanted to put doom and gloom before you first before I give you hope. Well, if we're losing five people a year, what do we have to do to maintain that balance? We have to gain five people a year. We have to have five people from outside of our church come to our church, become a part of our church to replace those five people that are being lost. That's my prayer for this year. Lord, bring at least five people to our church from outside of our church to join our family. Bring those people. If we want to see our church remain as it is for years to come, we have to bring in five people each year to replace the five that were lost. Again, that's not going to be the total lost every year, but let, let, let's shoot for that. So how do we do that? We do what Jesus commanded us in Matthew 28. We make disciples. We go to the lost and seek to reach them with the gospel. Once they're saved and baptized, we teach them all that Jesus commanded them. So they grow in their faith. It's the ancient formula that Jesus gave the church, and it needs no updating. It doesn't need a hip name. It doesn't need you know, some kind of new way of doing it. We just do what he told us. We, we go get them, and we teach them everything. Let me, let me show you a symbol I want to put before you a lot this year. And this isn't exact. It's just the best I can make on PowerPoint. PowerPoint is boring. Um, everybody on the planet is somewhere on this cycle. You're on this cycle somewhere. This is called the disciple cycle. I didn't have a name for this, but I showed it to Caleb, and he said, that's the disciple cycle. And so I'm like, okay, that's what we'll call it. Cool. Um, Everybody on the planet is on this cycle somewhere. You are, I am, your family is, your neighbors are, the the clerk at Publix is, the, the guy in the middle of the rainforest in South Africa who's never met another human being, he's on this somewhere. You start at lost... Then you go to saved, unchurched, church, whatever. Growing in their faith, going to the lost. Somewhere on that chart is where we all are. The disciple cycle. They're lost or unchurched in that they don't know Jesus, or they aren't in church. They have no affiliation with a church at all. Saved or church members, they are... That they receive Christ, they join the church. Before you know Jesus, you're lost, you are dead in your sins, Ephesians 2 says. When, you, when you're saved, John 3 says, you're born again. You're like a newborn baby. You're like my son eight months ago when he was born. Like you're, you're like that spiritually. And so you start growing. You start growing in your faith. You, you start growing, you learn all the things you need to learn, just like a baby does when they're born. A baby is born, and they have to learn how to raise their head. They have to learn how to eat. They have to learn how to walk and crawl and talk and everything else. They have to learn all that. So as people, when people are saved, they start growing. They have to learn how to, they have to learn and understand Jesus better. They have to um, get acquainted with the Bible. They have to come to love and serve the church. Like they, they grow up in Christ. And we come to going. That's the final step. That's where we all want to be. We're going to the lost. Going. That is moving beyond the walls of our church and seeking to reach people in their lives with the message of Jesus. With with that good news. We desire people to reach maturity in Christ. Ephesians 4, Paul says, grow up in every way to full mature manhood in Jesus. You start at that newborn baby, you want to reach full grown man as a Christian. The mature Christian is involved in reaching the lost and building the church. That, that, that's what they do. One of the passages I turn to in a lot when I'm thinking about myself as a pastor is Galatians 4, 19. 
And I have a new picture of this now that I'm a father. My little children for who I am again in the anguish of childbirth until Christ is formed in you. And like, like Paul says about the Galatians, like I am bearing through childbirth trying to get Christ to be formed in you. That, that's, that's what he's doing for the church. That's what I want to strive to do. I don't do that perfectly at all by, by any means. But, but that's one of the things that I constantly come back to as my marching orders as a pastor. To make disciples is such, uh, I'm to do that in such a way where, where you grow to maturity and you begin to reproduce yourself. Because I cannot possibly reach every lost person in your life. I, I can't. I cannot possibly grow every person in this church to where they need to be from saved to going. I just don't have the bandwidth to do all that myself. The, the, the New Testament says that pastors equip the saints for the work of ministry. Pastors do it so that the church can then do it themselves. We all do it together. We grow each other from saved or lost to going. We, we, we get there. So which spot in the cycle are you on? It's a question for you to ask yourself this morning. Which spot are you at? Where are you at? Now, which spot are those in your life at? Think about each person in your life that maybe you have a burden for. Where are they at? We want to move people from lost to going. Wherever they're at, move them to the next step. So what, 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 what will we do this year to help achieve that? Well, so in the fall of 2019, one of my major blunders as a pastor, I had all the deacons together at church one evening, and I laid out all kinds of ideas I had for 2020 at our church. And after I finished, they all looked at me like deer in the headlights. And I looked at them like deer in the headlights. Because as I talked through all the ideas, I realized I had about five years worth of activities planned. And so I learned a very important leadership principle that night. KISS, K-I-S-S, -S, keep it simple, stupid. That's why I needed to learn that night, and I did. This year, I'm going to give you an evangelism focus and a discipleship focus. We're going to aim for both of those to reach lost people and to grow saved people. So evangelism, first of all, in case you don't know, just in case you don't know the term, evangelism means telling the good news of Jesus to others. The Greek word for gospel is evangel. We're evangelizing people with the good news. This year, we're going to have four times that you'll be encouraged and challenged to share the gospel with people in your life or invite them to church. There's going to be kind of one of those per season, spring, summer, fall, winter. Um, I'm waiting a little bit into the year before I start these because it's probably still a few months before things are a little back to normal. Um, I'm hoping by May things are a little back to normal in the world. Um, as they get the vaccine out, it's hopefully people finally figure out what to do. Um, I don't know what all four of those things are yet. I know what the first one is. The first one is um, I'm going to preach a sermon series on marriage when I finish John. Um, that's going to be, I think, in May and June. I'm going to preach a sermon series on marriage. Um, you're going to get these postcards I'm going to make with kind of a graphic and the schedule of the sermons. And I'm going to try to get about five of those in each of your hands and say, hey, find married couples in your life and say, hey, our pastor's preaching about how to have a good marriage. Come check it out. So they'll come, they'll be here, um, invite married couples you know, invite single people you know who want to be married, invite them. And during this series, we will at one point have a Saturday lunch um, where Adrian and I will teach them how to have, um, well, teach them or you if you want to come, how to manage time and money within marriage. Um, the Lord's gifted us in that area. We've taught that to um, ABAC once, the, the BCM there, not for married people, but, but for people. Um, so we're going to do that. And then the final Sunday of that series, anyone who's been invited by, by one of you and has come, um, they're going to be invited the whole time. Hey, the final Sunday of this series, you're going to have a breakfast here. Um, Adrian and I are going to have breakfast with you. We'll, we'll have some of you dispersed through in there. Um, and, and they will come. They'll have breakfast with, with Adrian and I and some of you. And we will say, um, we'll, we'll get to know them. We'll share about our church with them. And hopefully some people stick from that. Hopefully that's a way that we get some people a part of our family. Re making disciples, reaching the lost. That's what we're called to do. Um, summer, fall, and winter, I don't know yet. The Lord hasn't revealed, but, but He will. Um, these are not the only evangelism things I have planned for the year, but they're the big four. They're the four things I want us to focus on. Question, where do we find lost people? Maybe you don't know any lost people. Maybe, maybe that's a struggle of yours. It's a struggle of mine. I go sit in Panera every week and write my sermon just trying to make connections with people while I'm there. Um, don't necessarily think lost if you don't know any. Think unchurched. People you know who aren't in church. 
pe people you know that don't go to a church on Sunday. If you've ever been out in town during the Sunday morning church hour, people are everywhere. Like if we left right now and drove to town, people would be everywhere in Tifton. They, they, they would. The, the Chula Dollar General is probably packed right now. Let, let me make this more real for you, though. The population of Tiff County, it's about 40,000, a little more than 40,000. Um, Mel Baptist churches, there's 30 of them. The, the membership combined is about 10,000. But that's not really accurate because there's 40,000 people in Tiff County. Um, just of our members, there's like 30 of our members that don't even live in Tiff County anymore. They've moved off. Every church has people like that. So those don't even factor into the number. The average worship attendance of all 30 churches combined is 4,200. 40,000 people in Tifton, 4,200 in a Baptist church. Let's take it even farther. The lostness of Georgia. Stats say only 15% of Georgia, of the Georgia population is in church on any given Sunday. And that includes Mormons and Jehovah's Witnesses. 15% of people are in church on Sunday morning. Stats say about 70% of Georgians are lost. That is, 70% of the people in our state will spend forever in eternal conscious torment. They will gasp for breath forever, and they will never get one. They will suffer under righteous justice for their sins. But there's hope for them in the cross. We've got to take that to them. The fields are ripe for harvest. We just have to go harvest them. They're ready. You may not know any lost people, but only 10% of Tiff County is in a Baptist church on average on Sunday morning. That doesn't include other denominations, obviously, but, but we must go get them. Love compels us to reach these people. What about missions? Uh, missions and evangelism often use the same kind of term. Um, I'll be laying out my plans for missions for the church in the next few months, not, not right now. Um, but, but I'm going to have a guy come and preach later in the year named Samuel Ayala. He's a missions coordinator for the Georgia Baptist Mission Board. He, I've had lunch with him twice, and every time I have lunch with him, I leave wanting to conquer the world. He's just that encouraging of a guy. He's really energetic. He's really passionate about missions, about reaching the lost. Um, we'll, we'll, we'll talk about missions when when. when when he comes that day. Um, but, but let's be thinking locally this year. How can we do missions to our community, to Chula and to Tifton and all the surrounding places? How can we reach college students? How can we reach out to the poor, the homeless people? How can we reach out to the Hindu population? We've got a Hindu temple down Carpenter, down Wooden Mill Road. How can we reach those people? Because there's a big population of those people in our county. How can we reach Hispanic people? How can we reach Generation Z, people born between 1997 and 2012? It's the least Christian generation in history. How can we reach them? What can we do? How can we engage people online? I hate social media, you know that. But the fact is, people are on it. It's a mission field. So what can we do to engage that mission field? What, what can we do? So evangelism, reaching the lost. Now discipleship, growing the saved, growing the found. To going. Simply put, discipleship is being and growing as a disciple of Jesus. Growing in that. Um, we have here a three-legged stool. This is actually a table that you can put something decorative on because it's really hard to find a three-legged stool. They've mostly become four-legged, I guess, for support. Um, but three-legged stool. I want this to be what we constantly come back to this year. You need a three-legged stool in your discipleship. Jesus had three groups of people in his ministry. He had the 120 who followed him around. It's the people he taught regularly. Within those 120, he had 12, his 12 disciples. He had those 12 disciples everywhere. He poured everything he had into those 12. But then even within those 12, he had three. He had his inner three, Peter, James, and John. Peter, James, and John were present at a lot of events that... The rest of the disciples weren't. They were at the Transfiguration. They were in Gethsemane, um, closer to Jesus than the others were. They were at certain miracles. Jesus would bring them along. Two of them became the most prominent disciples in the early church, Peter and John. James was killed kind of early, but, but Peter and John went on to become the most influential disciples. We need those three groups in our lives as disciples of Jesus. We, we, we need all three of those. It's a three-legged stool. We need 120, we need 12, we need 3. What are those? Well, 120 is obviously what we're doing right now. 
It's congregational worship. You, you, you need to be at congregational worship. This is the worship service. Be here, participate, and serve. Are you musically gifted? Let's get you singing. Do you have some kind of gift that you think could be useful in worship? Let's see how we could use that. Do you feel like God's calling you to preach? Let's see if that's your gifting. Congregational worship is not a product for you to buy and, and personalize. The Bible commands you to be here. Hebrews 10.25, do not neglect gathering together as is the habit of some. It's a sin to neglect gathering to worship. You need to be here. There's no exception clause for, for you, you don't like the music style at the church or you get bored by the current sermon series or your kids didn't want to go that morning. There's no exception clause. You need to be here to sing God's praises, to hear the preaching of the word, to take the Lord's Supper and to fellowship with other believers. You, you can do those first two on, on the internet, but you can't do those second two on the internet. You need the 120, you need the 12. We call that Sunday school. You need to be in Sunday school. That's probably the best model of this. Maybe youth group or syrup soppers is another model. Men's ministry, women's ministry. Um, you need a smaller group of people within our church that you spend a lot of time with, that you're close to. You need a smaller group of people that you get to know well. We don't just come to Sunday school and listen to the lesson. Get here early and interact with people beforehand. Ask them how they're doing. Take, them, take interest in their lives. Uh, as more people come back to Sunday school, we're going to relaunch the classes. Um, Adrian and I are starting the youth class next Sunday. Youth, come. We'll, we'll be in the youth house. We're, we're, we're teaching that this year. Um, we're breaking that off from the adult class in the fellowship hall. You need the 120. You need the 12. You need the 3. The three. In college, I was in what's called a discipleship group. We were four guys that met every week. Um, we had Bible study. We prayed, and we, had, we held each other accountable. We talked about what was going on in life. We prayed for one another. We offered counsel to each other and how to handle those situations. And those guys who, the guy who led that is my biggest mentor in life. He's almost like a second father to me. It's kind of funny because he's born three days after my, my real father. Um, he called me back in November and said, hey, you want to come up and teach a retreat at the BCM? And I said, I don't know how I'm going to pull it off, but if you call me to come teach, I'm going to come. Um, so I went. I led a group like that, a discipleship group in seminary with, with some of the guys in the, in the dorm. And um, all those guys that have been in discipleship groups with me are my closest friends in the world now. When I was, when Adrian and I got married, we, we each had seven people in our, in our, you know, people that we had with us. Um, Adrian had a lot of friends, so I got friends to match them. Six of the seven guys in my group were in one of these groups. The only one that wasn't was Adrian's brother, which I had just met. The, my, my closest friends in the world. You need a core group of people like this in your life. So that when you're struggling with sin, you have someone to reach out to. So that when your marriage is on the rocks, you've got someone to talk to about it. So that when you're anxious, you, you, you can talk to somebody. I, I had a sort of an anxiety attack this week that lasted a few days. And some of these guys, I was texting the whole time, hey, I need help. Pray for me. Help me out. What, what, what's going wrong with me? When you don't understand what God is doing in your life, you need a group of people like this within the church. Don't go through those times alone. You need that core group. So I'm starting this year something that will take a few years to develop. Um, I'm starting a discipleship group. It'll be three to five people that meet regularly. I'm going to lead one this year. It's a year-long time together, and at the end of that year, um, if they want to keep going, they can keep going. I'll pull out and start another one, and, and we'll multiply it in that way. If you're here and you're a guy and you want to be in that, talk to me, because I've got a couple guys ready but, but haven't been able to f form a full group yet. It's a once a week meeting. We'll have several weeks off throughout the year. It's a focused time of spiritual growth. This isn't a class where you sit and hear a lesson. You participate in this. You share about life. You share what you learned in the Bible that week. You memorize scripture together. There will be a short lesson, kind of things you need to know to be a healthy disciple. That's not necessary for the group to exist, but I'm going to have that. Um, we'll pray for each other, and we'll set a goal for the coming week. How can we grow in our faith this week? What can we do? And my goal is for these to multiply, for it to get to where multiple people in our church are leading groups like this. It's going to take some time to form that, though, because the kingdom of heaven starts as a piece of leaven, and it spreads throughout the entire loaf. Training for these types of groups takes more than a 15-minute explanation of how to do it. It kind of takes watching it and seeing how it's done.
My dream is that eventually most of our church will have gone through a group like this. Men, if you want to participate, let, let me know. Um, what about women, though? Adrian has plans for women's ministry this year that will be revealed over time. Eventually, I want us to have these groups for women as well. The problem is they work best as single-gender groups, so I can't lead them for women. Because a man is never going to share his struggles when women is, are in the room, and vice versa. So I can't lead a women's group. Until they develop, these don't necessarily have to be formal groups. They don't have to be. Another discipleship group I had in seminary wasn't a Bible study. It was just a breakfast. We called it the breakfast club. We would meet twice a week for breakfast, and we'd just chat. We'd talk about the Lord. We would talk about what the Lord was teaching us. We'd pray for each other, but we would just talk. One of those guys was Scotty, who came and preached here last year. When I'm struggling, those are the first guys I contact. We have a group text that runs back to Kingdom Come on the other side, back in, his, in the past Kingdom Come, not the future Kingdom Come. Um, we didn't necessarily do Bible study every morning, but we certainly talked about the Lord every morning. So let me ask you, which of these three legs do you not have in your life, and which one could you practically pursue right now? Because you need all three of these to be a healthy disciple. So if you um, have the 120 and have the 12, but you don't have the 3, this is what you look like. Well, if you have the 120, but you don't come to Sunday school, you don't have some smaller group in the church that you're a part of, that's what you look like. If you don't have three and you don't come to Sunday school and you don't come to church, which I don't think is any of you since, since you're here, but just for argument's sake, that's what you look like as a disciple of Jesus. That's how you're growing. You, you need all three of these. But if you've only got one, aim for having a second one. Pick one of those and say, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start coming to Sunday school. Or I'm going to find some people in this church that I can meet with regularly and we can invest in each other in a sort of a discipleship group. So, keep it simple, stupid. Four ways that we can do evangelism this year, and three ways to grow in your faith through discipleship and to invest in others. Just to let you know a few other things that are happening this year, some activities this year that are on the docket that aren't scheduled yet, just so you're aware. Adrian's going to be planning to do another women's Bible study this year, um, probably in the summer. We're going to do a fifth Sunday hymn sing at some point, probably in the fall. Um, that was one of the most requested things on that survey I did for this year. Um, we're going to do fall Bible studies like we did last year in the spring. We had a lot of people interested in that and a lot of people that came. We're going to do that in the fall. Um, in this time of COVID and crazy world that we're in, a lot of people are dealing with anxiety. So this spring, I'm going to be preaching a sermon series on anxiety and depression and how to battle that. And actually, one of those nights, I'm going to have a biblical counselor come in here, and he and I are just going to talk on stage about anxiety and depression and how to battle that biblically and how to win the war over that. What about all the things we're already doing? Well, um, as I said, next week, Sunday school for youth starts back. So, so youth come be a, a part of that. In February, we're going to start prayer meeting back. Um, it's going to be a little different. It's at 6.30. Um, we're going to spend a lot of time during it praying. I'm going to do very little teaching in it. We're going to spend a lot of time praying for various things every single week. The greatest moves of God in history started with people praying a lot. Started with people getting on their faces and seeking His face. That's what we're going to do. We're going to do that. Sunday evenings are going to remain at 6 p.m. All the other things, we'll give you a date later when those start. They're not quite off the ground yet. As we think about this year, this is what this year looks like, and I'm super excited for it. Hear the words of the psalm I read earlier, though, in light of everything I've just shared. Psalm 126. When the Lord restored the fortunes of Zion, we were like those who dream. Then our mouth was filled with laughter and our tongue with shouts of joy. And they said among the nations, the Lord has done great things for them. The Lord has done great things for us. We are glad. May this be our prayer this year. We want the Lord to do great things among us. We want the lost to be saved 
We want those of us who are saved to grow from, from being saved, growing as babies, growing into adults, to where we are going and reproducing ourselves and reaching the lost. I'm praying that the Lord would work greatly among us this year. Will you join me in praying for that? We're going to take a moment and pray. I want you to pray. Um, I'm going to give you 30 seconds to pray silently, and then I will close us. I want you to pray for yourself. I want you to pray for our church. And I want you to pray for lost people that you know. Think of those people in your mind. Someone you know who doesn't know Jesus. Pray for them right now. And let this be a time that you begin praying for them regularly. That, that, that every week you will pray for these people to come to know the Lord. So 30 seconds, you pray now, and then I'll close us. Let's pray. Father, I have called this that I've laid out a, a vision. Um, Lord, we know that, that vision only comes from you. And so um, in reality, this is practical ways that I have prayerfully considered carrying out the great commission that you've called us to do. I pray that um, you will direct our steps. Lord, it, it is not... Um, it, it, it is not me who, who, who steers the tides of history, it's you. I can make plans, but you direct my steps and our steps. Father, I pray for every person here. Lord, I pray that they would grow in their faith, grow to know you better, grow to love you more, grow to, to rejoice and be glad in the great things that you do. Father, I pray that um, we would see five people come to our church this year who haven't been a part of our church but would join and become a part here. Lord, that, that we, we pray that all five be lost and that they would receive Jesus and, and we'd see radical demonstrations of transformation in their lives. Oh, Lord, show us that. We want to see that. But Lord, if they're just Christians who, who aren't in church but, but come and be a part of church, Lord, we, we, we'll take that as well. Bring people here who can begin to see the saving work of Jesus play out in their lives, not just in their salvation, but in their growth. Lord, we're on the path of following you. We're on that path. We're becoming more and more like Jesus day by day. Make us more and more like Jesus. Until that day when we will see his face and you will complete the work that you started in us. Oh Lord, do that in us, we pray. Save the lost and grow the found through our faithfulness this year, Lord. You're the one who, we plant the seeds, you're the one who gives the growth. Would, would you give the growth? We pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen.